Good Monday morning, everyone. You're listening to Author Talk with me, Amy Fern Russell, and our lovely author guest today is Mark Leslie. So you guys, let's talk about the weekend. First of all, it's my birthday week. I will be 31 on Friday, okay? And then my husband will be 29 on the 6th. You're old, girl. I know, and my daughter will be four on the 8th. Okay, let's throw 4th of July in there and Fern's birthday in there as well, right? And then a month later is Sky's third birthday. So it's birthday season up here in my house. Josh has gone out of town, so my sister-in-law is hanging out with me. And I've never felt old. If you want to feel old, hang out with the 16-year-old, okay? Because they make you feel old. I'm not even... She had never seen the movie Accepted, which is wrong. That's like a rite of passage movie. So we watched that. But I'm going to be conquering painting my house next weekend with me and Josh. And Russell's going to give me a ton of hell. And I know it's I coming. thought I told you not to do that. Oh, You'll get Russell. divorced. I'm not going to. No, we did really well with the backsplash. Okay. So we're just going to test our limits on painting. I Okay. Now, and to be completely fair, 100%, I did advocate for painters because I am not a patient person and I don't want to do it, but need I say more, we're going to do it. But I got my backyard fixed, you guys. Yes, my backyard is not flooding. It's graded properly and it has grass. So it was a big week for all of us over here at the Ravi Chandran household. Okay, a lot of fun, fun, fun. And it's hot as hell here. So we're Martin, this is the woman the that made her husband sell one of his motorcycles so she could get an SUV. This is who I she is. I did not. Okay. Russell so tells this One story. of his motorcycles? He, he lies. He has two. He has two. He lies. Russell lies. Okay. Full disclaimer. Russell's a liar. Okay. I did not. He volunteered to sell one of his. He volunteered. Yeah, and I can didn't. imagine the conversations <laughs> before he volunteered. I can okay. imagine. He volunteered. Okay, that's my story, and I'm going to stick to that story. He volunteered it, okay, so I could have the lovely car that I have, and it wasn't even for the car. It was because he wanted this other motorcycle that he now has that he hasn't driven, okay? So a full disclosure, I did not make my husband sell it. He volunteered, and I took him up because I know better than to be like, no, don't do that. No. He volunteers that you take it up. There's no back seats, okay? In my household, there's no back seats. So that is actually what happened. But um, also sickness, the plague has hit my household. You guys, again, we have strep throat for the third time in three months. Woohoo! Yay! No one come to the Ravi Chandran household, okay? <laughs> Just decided we're quarantining ourselves from everybody. But other than that, it's been fantastic and a lot of fun. You know that- Oh, I you like have- Children, Amy. You have children, and I know, but the they're only three days. and two. They're only three and two, and I mean, I've never what had strep throat. It's day school no disease. Three. That's what it is. I'm telling you, I've never had it in my life. I turned thirty, and I have kids. I got it three times in three months. It's awful, and we've mm -hmm. had it three different ways. Okay, because I who knew that strep comes in different variations? Okay, I did not. Did not. <laughs> I learned this the hard way. I learned this very much the hard way, but. You know, I had to throw in that it's my birthday week because it just, I had to. But what all did everybody else do this weekend? I know you guys lived more adventurous, crazy lives than I did. So who wants to go first? Well, I think first Russell could go first. I'm dying to tell this story. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Go. So my daughter lives in Houston. I'm in Atlanta. Uh, so she was telling us this story last night, and I thought, I've got to tell this on the podcast. So her neighbor from behind her his daughter graduated from high school this year and is going to college in August. And she's allowed her to have a few pool parties that have gotten out of control, I would say, or she would say, over the, okay. the summer so far in Houston. And the summer in Houston starts in April. So it's been a while. <laughs> so that her neighbor from behind was getting married this weekend in Mexico and her Hi. daughter's in the wedding. But Friday night, uh, they heard a party back there, a really loud, maybe 50 to 70 
kids party, my wife was, I mean, my wife, my daughter was like, well, I guess the daughter hasn't gone yet. And uh, uh, so the next morning, she saw wedding pictures with the daughter in it. And since all Saturday night that it was packed and all Sunday it was packed. And this is what's happened is all these kids said, oh, they're out of town this weekend. We're just going to have, we're just going over to their house and have a party. So for the whole high school, this has been the Mecca for the whole weekend. Who knows what they've done? So that's pretty funny. That actually, it turned out, I thought I had kids I trusted when they were in high school. I didn't find out when, until they were adults that when I went snow skiing, that was a party weekend at our house. I didn't know that. <laughs> Apparently, uh, wedding weekend was a party weekend at this other person's house. Because, who sounds like they were living it up. They were celebrating. They were celebrating. They didn't get to go, so they threw their own little shindig in honor of them. I'm in full support. I see nothing wrong with that <laughs> at all. It's a rite of passage. It really what? is. Parents go away. It's party time. Exactly. Yeah, but there's no bike. This was a vacant house this weekend. Even mm-hmm. better. Party all the time. Yeah. I mean, true. You know, when I did, you know, that I had something similar happen when, when Mike and I went on a honeymoon, we came back to discover that some teenagers had camped out at my, at my house that was for sale and was vacant, you know, at the moment. And yeah, because we had a pool, you know. And so, yeah, they discovered it, it vacant house with a pool. Mm, party time, party time. Well, but to be completely honest, nowadays you can rent out your pool for pool parties. There's a whole app and you can, it's kind of like Airbnb, but for pools. And so if you have a pool and you want to make money, you can rent it out. So they, if they had a pool, they totally could have done that and been like, hey, let's make money while I'm at my wedding. I mean, I don't know. Well, then you know, that doesn't work, that okay? Was, but there, you can't do that for really, free. That's a Please really tell me the app is called idea. Water BNB. If, if, if the other one's Airbnb, this has got to be Water BNB for your pool. No, right? it's no. not oh, that. I don't on. remember the name of it. I'll have to look it up to get the name, but you can do that because I was looking to throw uh, my youngest, she wants a Little Mermaid party, and I was like, Little Mermaid pool party, yes, let's do it. And I was like, okay, I'll look it up. Well, no one in, in my little small city is running out their pool, which makes sense. It's a college town. I wouldn't do it either. It makes sense. But that's how I found out about it. So, I mean, there's all kinds of things out there. It's interesting. You guys don't have like a neighborhood pool that you could, you know, have a party? No, I have city pools and I have a membership because I think there's like four or five different city pools that I can go to. But see, then again, it's people-y, okay? It's people-y. The world's too people-y for me, okay? So it's just one of those things. I have to be in the mood and be like in the right mindset and be like, yes, I'm going to totally talk to people. and be like, yes, your kid's adorable. No big deal. I don't want to talk to people, okay? In all reality, I just don't. Call me if you want to talk to me. I'll talk to you on the phone, but not in person. It's too much of an effort, to be honest. But Vern, what did you do this weekend? Okay, so I had a really, really fun date. Um, We went to see a drag show. I had never seen a drag show, never been to a drag show, didn't know anything about it. And it was a blast. Oh, my Lord. These people can do makeup. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm Mm going to say they can do makeup. And they were hilarious. I was just like, one of them um, did, you know, animal so so she dressed up like a cow with the udders and stuff it was it was hilarious and then that's my and then spirit was, animal yes and then she was a llama after that and i was just yeah. like oh lordy this is hilarious i mean they were great there was a dolly parton nice because you know she and she did the whole jolene and everything it was great and then we all were singing you know dolly parton tunes but it was a really cool little date i was like oh this is nice I like it. I like it. And I've been writing. That's what I've been doing. I've been doing my writer's retreat with Max, you know, and trying to get my books done, trying to get the Writers Guild uh, conference, you know, organized and promoted and all that good stuff. But yeah, we took time out to go to this drag show. It was hilarious. I loved it. 
I totally would do it again. Although now I know you need to bring dollar bills because I didn't know that ahead of time that you have yeah. to bring dollar bills, you know? And so now I know. So next time, <laughs> ATM. <laughs> I love it. That's fun. That's fun and something different. I love it. I love it. Mark, what did you do? Now, I live uh, I live in southern Ontario, uh, Canada, and I, I drove up. It's about a five-hour drive north to Sudbury, Ontario for uh, Sudbury Graphicon, which is a Comic-Con that was uh, held in, in Sudbury there. And it was, they hadn't had it since prior to the pandemic. 2019 was the last one. So this is their, their, their first return. And it was an absolutely fantastic show. Uh, had my author booth. I didn't even have like, I brought way too many books. I couldn't put them all out, uh, but I had a great display. The attendance was fantastic. And I left with a lot less books and got to meet a lot of readers and stuff. It was just a really fantastic weekend, but exhausting because of all the driving um, back back down south um, yesterday again. Mark, sometimes this is a argument that Fern and I have had many times about uh, book booths at Comic Cons, and that is whether you think they are. Uh, mathematically productive what we which side obviously you're on fern side and you think they are productive why do you, think you, you they are? so book booths at comic cons yeah so i mean a lot of the people there i, I have to say about probably 60 to 70 percent of the people there are there for swords and and cosplay and comic books and those stupid pop-up bobblehead things that everyone buys a billion of and all kinds of pop culture stuff and art and things like that. So there's not as many book readers. So I'll give you that. But when you find a book reader um, and, and you, you have novels and you have books for people to buy, I have, you know, true ghost stories as well as novels and short story collections, all kinds of stuff. Uh, even some kids stuff that I now have available, even a coloring book with stories in it. So, uh, and, and particularly at this one, at this particular con, there were maybe six of us that actually had books. Most of the other people were doing art and other paraphernalia. So all the book nerds pretty much visited my booth because it's a small con. This is not one of the ones with, you know, 15,000, 25,000, 30,000 people. Maybe four to 6,000 people came through. But every single book nerd is going to gravitate to the book people, right? And you, and you can tell them. <laughs> you can see when they're walking by if they're book nerds or not. Uh, there's nothing better than book nerds since we're book nerds too. So, mm -hmm. uh, before we get started on Mark's books, I would like to thank the people that listen to us on the podcast. Mark, we have discovered last year that we have moved into the top ten independent book podcast in America. We were very, we're very humbled that people listen to us. Most people listen to us during the week. They don't watch us on Monday mornings, and we want to thank them. Amy, where can people find us on the podcast? Yeah, so you can find us anywhere that you can listen to podcasts. So Amazon Music, Spotify, Good Pods, Apple, Google, all of the places that you can search for a podcast, you can find us. And if Russell can find us, you can find us. So just type in author talk. It's two words. You'll see the crimson, red, and gold logo that we have. You can listen to every episode that we have done for at least the past five years. It might be closer to eight. I don't know if I have all of them uploaded at the moment, but at least the last five years are up there so you can listen to us. But if you want to come over and have a good laugh, me and Fern are very animated. We control what comes out of our mouth, but not our facial expressions. And we talk a lot with our hands. And it's always kind of fun. Sometimes my kids will pop in if they're homesick or beat on the door. So if you want to have a good laugh, come on over to our YouTube channel, Facebook, or any one of our social media channels, and you can catch us live. We love engaging with you and answering questions and having a conversation with you live in time. So make sure that you do that if you're interested in it. But... Without further ado, I'm going to kick it to you, Fern, and let's get Mark talking about all of his books and his writing. Yes. Okay, Mark, your writing is so cool. We, Russell and I were just, you know, riffing before we started the show about it. So, werewolves. Your subject matter is a Canadian werewolf in New York. I think that is actually the uh, title of the book one, right? Yeah, uh, that, that is the, the first book, book. yep. Yeah. 
Yeah, I love it. So what made you decide to go with werewolves as your, uh, you know, subject matter? How did you land on that as your character? Uh, it, it was interesting. There was originally a call for submissions for a short story collection called uh, The Monster Within or The Beast Within or something like that. That was the theme. And what the editor was looking for was the stories of the man behind the monster. So they were looking for, you know, we want the story of uh, Jekyll, not Hyde. We want the story of Dr. Banner, not the Hulk. We want that sort of look at it. And and I hadn't really written too many tropey. I'd written a lot of horror, but it was mostly just made up stuff. I didn't go with the vampires and werewolves and stuff like that. I did use ghosts, of course, but I had never written, you know, traditional monster before. So I thought, wouldn't it be neat to look at the story of a man trying to live with the side effects of being a, a turning into a wolf? And 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 I went with the mythology that he turns into a a six foot long gray wolf, complete wolf, not half man, not half wolf. And he does it, uh, light of the full moon. He has no control over it. He has no consciousness either. So kind of like in the comics of the Hulk, because I was inspired by that. I thought, okay, he has no idea what he did the night before. No consciousness. He has no control. So the moon comes out, the sundown, and he's done, right? He, he can, changes. And, and, and I pictured, okay, how would I deal with this? And, and I had been to New York for the very first time. And I remember walking through Battery Park and looking at the wooded area just, just, just north of, of where you, you know, you take the um, you take the ferry across to Staten Island. And and I thought, wow, imagine waking up naked in this park with the taste of human blood in your mouth and a bullet hole in your leg and wondering what the hell you did the night before. And that was the premise for a short story I wrote called This Time Around. And it was a 10,000 word story. It did not get accepted. Uh, actually, it was it was about sixteen thousand words. I cut it down to ten thousand because that was the the cap. No, I think I had to cut it down to six thousand. But but <laughs> ten thousand is where it worked. Anyways, yeah, it, I didn't sell. Um, but a friend of mine, Sean Costello, who's a, a horror author from Canada, here he had read it and he goes, "Oh, this is great. Uh, um, what um, what happens next?" And 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 the premise was he has to get to a, a morning meeting uh, in Midtown Manhattan. So first of all, he's got to figure out how to find clothes, and it's kind of humorous as he discovers discarded mm -hmm. panties and he puts them on and he, you know, barters his way with, with um, a bag lady to try and get clothes and just kind of what makes his way to this appointment. And that's where the story ends when he finally makes it there on time. And then Sean said, well, what happens the rest of his day? And he kept bugging me for months and months afterwards until I finally started to write the novel. And I just expanded it into a full day. And I wanted to look at Michael as a man with, I'll see he has side effects, right? So he has enhanced sense uh especially during the cycle of the full moon they're really you know he's he's got superpowers basically almost like an adaptation of what you'd see from daredevil or wolverine and i thought okay if he has these things and also like me if he was inspired by spider-man comics well he knows that with great power comes great responsibility so he can't help but sticking his his nose into other people's business and and helping other people along the way, which kind of sidetracks him in his original. This is quest. getting better and better as you describe <laughs> it. It's getting better and better. <laughs> oh, God, I'm glad to hear that, Russell. And that well, was I, supposed to be a standalone novel. Yeah. And then another editor asked me for a short story for another anthology, and that kicked off. Well, what happens if he gets caught on a train on his way to Stowe, Vermont, and, and he's going to turn into a wolf before it gets there? How's he going to deal with this? And then that became the novel Stowaway. And then all of a sudden I realized, oh, I think there's a series here. Mm -hmm. And now you're into all the way to book six because th the newest one, Hex in the City, that is book six in this series, yes? Yeah. Very yeah. Cool. yeah, yeah. Hex yeah. in the City and co-authored with uh, Julie Strauss. Get the yes, I was going to ask because I was reading about this and I find this fascinating. So in this book, you are delving into his romantic life, his his uh, falling in love, and you decided to have some uh, chapters point of view from the girlfriend's point of view, and you invited Julie to write those. And so, what made you decide to to a invite another author to partake of that and and you know how was this collaboration? Um, you know, did you did you enjoy it? Were there any challenges to it? Uh, actually, there's a bit of a backstory to that. <laughs> so, in the first novel, shortly after he makes it to his breakfast appointment, he finds out he's going to be on the Letterman show, and his agent's like, "Yeah, last minute booking. I got you on the show. You're there tonight, but I got whatever." 
he gets back to his apartment and his ex-girlfriend that he hasn't seen in five or six years shows up and says, Andrews, I know you're a wolf. I need your help. My fiance has been kidnapped. So it sets this up with Gail, who he's still in love with because she dumped them because he had to lie to her about why he was disappearing 10 days <laughs> every month. <laughs> couldn't find him where like every night he's gone. What's he doing? What's he up? So she you know, thought he was having an affair. Uh, anyway, so Gail comes back, has figured it out that he's a wolf and needs his help because his, her fiance has been kidnapped. And that's one of the side uh, tracks. Anyways, throughout the series, he's still desperately in love with Gail. Gail um, doesn't end up marrying the, the man that was kidnapped, but doesn't want to be anything more than a friend to him. So there's this tension throughout the story of him still in love with her. Well, my readers requested multiple times, I'd love to see the story of when Michael and Gail met. I'd love that story. It'd be great. Sounds like she was the perfect woman for him. I want that story. And so I thought, well, okay, I'll write it as a romance. So Lover's Moon was, again, meant to be a short story. Uh, about how they met. And it was just meant to be a little extra that I would give to the readers. And it turned into an, a, a novella, then a novel. And, and so I, I contacted my friend, Julie Strauss, who had read all the books in the series. And I had trouble writing Gail because I wanted it to, to be a duet perspective, male, then female, then male, then female, and then tell it as a love story. I couldn't write Gail because like Michael, I loved her too much. I put her on a pedestal. I couldn't make her realistic. Julie was able to give her flaws, give her a voice, and, and writing Lover's Moon was a phenomenal experience because I couldn't write a romance novel, but Julie had done numerous ones, and she had never written monstery stuff. So we, we did it tropey like a romance story. It's still set within the universe, and we told their backstory. We had so much fun with that, and in the backstory, we pulled out these elements of other characters that I didn't even know existed until Julie created them. And that led to the premise for Hex in the City. It, it, it all comes back years, years later. And, and when I went to write Hex in the City initially as a standalone, I realized this is best told through both their voices, Michael's first person perspective and Gail's first person's perspective. So I reached out to Julie and I said, I know it's not a romance novel. We're going right back to urban fantasy humorous adventure, but I really would love if you could write Gail's point of view. And and she wrote Gail's point of view uh, for Hex in the City. And both experiences were absolutely phenomenal. I mean, we are different in the way we approach things and the way that we write things. We're different in our in our attitudes towards time and space. Uh, Julie's anal when it comes to plotting. I'm a pantser. But I'm anal when it comes to time and space. And she's just all over the map. So we kind of complement each other and help each other. And we tag teamed uh, both novels like, chapter one. Okay. Now you write chapter two and then I'm going to write chapter three. And like, we just went through it really, really fast, edited each other's work along the way. And then when we finished it, we gave it another edit before we passed it on to a third party editor. And oh my God, it was just such an amazing experience. She had so much fun with Gail that she's actually right now writing a spinoff series uh, oh, featuring some of Gail's solo adventures. So, <laughs> a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. That is very cool because, you know, you you hear sometimes about how difficult it is when you collaborate with authors, but it's so cool when when that collaboration just clicks and you're both, you dive right into the universe and you're in it. So I know Russell had a very critical question about your werewolf waking up in Battery Park. Right, Russell? Yes, I did, but he's kind of answered it because the question is, you know, during during the old '30s movies, the werewolves were insane, uh, and they would they were all bloodthirst. There was no consciousness, as you uh, spoke about earlier, so they would wake up and not know where they were. In the '50s and '60s, they kind of moved to where the werewolf had some consciousness in, in him. Even in the Harry Potter books where there's a werewolf, that werewolf is actually conscious and rescues. Uh, so I was wondering which kind. Was it where he could plan ahead? And like you were talking about your Vermont train. Seems like really bad planning to be on a train when you know you're in the month of the moon or whatever however you describe that much more poetically than i just did the full moon so, moment so how do you stoic how would a stoic plan as a werewolf 
ahead of time. And I know you've dealt with that in your mm -hmm. humor. Oh, yeah, 100%. So I have Michael, uh, he usually goes to Central Park for the change. He knows it's coming. He gets there 15 to 20 minutes early because he usually has no memory of 10 minutes before and after. Uh, and I even base this on my own experience. Uh, I had epilepsy. I'm, I for fortunately have uh, grown out of it uh, after after puberty. But when I used to have a seizure, I would I would have these moments of I, I would not remember the 10 minutes before the seizure happened. And so I was basing some of that on on the reality of, you know, turning into something different for, a, for a, a, you know, losing consciousness or whatever. Now, so he he stores clothes in, in, in spots in Battery Park. And then sometimes, you know, homeless people will find them and steal them. And sometimes, you know, when it rains, the one time he, he goes to put the thing on and, and like there's a wet area in his crotch and people are laughing at him because, you know, whatever. So there, there's a lot of mishaps related to that. Um, the the stowaway, the premise for that, because uh, he's very consciously aware of it, is uh, Gail had a family emergency and was off, the, off in stow with a, a, a favorite uncle who was, was on his deathbed and Michael was rushing to want to be with her, uh, wasn't able to fly because his passport had expired at the time. And so he's like, well, I'll just get on the train and I'll figure it out. Maybe I'll just get off. Like he didn't know. I'll get, maybe I'll get off a stop or we'll, fig we'll figure it out. And then I ended up having him uh, go to help a young woman who was on the run from a human predator. Uh, and, and so he ends up st uh, sticking with her. So so he is very, very conscious of the full moon and when, what time the sunset's going to be and all that stuff. And he normally plans ahead, but every once in a while, the emotions take over and he gets <laughs> he gets sidetracked. But so he is, um, and, I'm, and I'm glad you mentioned that because when I looked at the werewolf mythology, I was wondering about that. And, and you very rarely see just snippets or flashbacks to him as a wolf. The wolf is... Uh, Alpha Wolf, he's a beta human because uh, he's a mild-mannered Canadian pushover kind of Peter Parker kind of guy. Um, but also he, um, as as a wolf, he he's not a violent, like they're two distinctive personalities. The wolf is just a wolf and wolves do not kill for sport. Wolves do not kill for game. They kill for territory or food. Whereas humans are psychopaths and humans will kill for whatever. So uh, a werewolf he encounters in the first book, the other wolf encroaching on his territory, is completely consciously aware and can control turning into a wolf. And, and later in the series, he meets another person who can turn into a wolf. Now, Michael believes the reason he's not psychopathic is because his mind blocks the connection to, to, to the wolf, that that would potentially cause him to be crazy and maybe be violent. And maybe that's where the werewolf mythology came from. He does meet a wolf who's not crazy who turns. And so in book seven, which is coming out in 2024, um, only monsters in the building, Michael ends up having to go to a, a retreat for monsters up in upstate New York, where there's going to be a murder mystery. But his, he's going to therapy because he's trying to figure out why can't I control it? Why, like, like other people can control the change. Other people have human consciousness. I'm the only wolf I've met <laughs> that can't do it. What's wrong with me? Uh, so again, he's going off on this therapy, and of course, part of it will be a murder mystery where uh, where the 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 person who's treating all these monsters ends up being found murdered, and one of them is guilty. So that should be fun. I love it. I love it. So there are therapists for the monsters. For paranormal, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, you know, monsters need therapy too, right? Truth, truth, very much so. We very all much need so. therapy. We all need therapy. Uh, for Russell, sorry, I don't know yeah. about you. I'm perfect. Okay. I don't know about you. No, I don't you, need I don't need therapy. I don't know. You, your husband Josh needs a lot of therapy. <laughs> he does. Thing. You know but, what? You always say that. Poor Josh. I don't I must I don't. say mm -hmm. the next the next question and you made me forget my question. <laughs> oh. We were talking about therapy for monsters and everybody yes. needs therapy. Oh, and I want to know about the superpowers, uh, the superpower part of him, uh, what part of it does that make in the story? He yeah, you were dropped that one second and then moved on. Yeah, you were reading my mind because I was wanting to come back to like, how do his senses, you know, affect him as a human, you know? So, yes, Russell, we're brain faxing. <laughs> So, I mean, he can, uh, he can, uh, he has extra sensory smell, uh, taste, sound. He can hear things the average person can't hear. 
Um, but he can tell, like he can hear the heart, your heartbeat. So he can tell if you're lying. He can he can sense emotion. So he can really read people. That makes him makes him really really good at manipulating people, uh, even subconsciously, because just in a conversation, he kind of knows what they want. So he gives it to them, and he's able to use that to his advantage. Which is how I explain how he got a publisher to like. He's a successful writer. It's a you know wish fulfillment. He's a successful New York Times bestselling author who's had movies made from his books. So that it ex sort of explains how he's been able to work his way in the industry by, you know, the, some of the people that he's met, he's been able to charm them and stuff like that. So that those, those powers tend to get stronger and stronger the closer to the cycle of the full moon. And they never really diminish all the way back to normal human. Um, but it's so, really important. Like, do they, does he have like... Because it would be very fascinating to see how do you yeah. describe sense, you know, because like, you know, like does adrenaline have a scent? Does fear have a scent? Does, you know, do, does he, is there yeah. a scent that he's, that he kind of picks up on if someone has kind of a negative intention and that kind yeah. of thing, you know? Yeah, no, he does pick up on all of those emotions. And 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 again, I mean, I even base a lot of it on, you know, my dogs and stuff like that, that they can tell when you're anxious, they can tell when you're angry, they can tell the different moods and stuff like that. So it was basing it on him understanding all those different things or being able to hear things like cries for help mm -hmm. and stuff like that, that the average person wouldn't hear. Um, scenting people based on the perfume. So for example, when Gail comes back into his life, it's been six years since he's seen her. And he's like, oh, this, this familiar smell, I'm not sure what it is. And then he realizes once you see, oh my God, that's that's Gail's perfume and her, and her shampoo and like all the scents I'm familiar with her and her body odor and stuff like that. So those those come into play a lot. It, it, in, in later in the series, he meets somebody who has who has a paranormal ability that that basically nullifies paranormal. So for the first time in his life, he gets to see the moon over New York City because when he's with this woman, he doesn't turn into a wolf. He doesn't have paranormal abilities. He can finally be human. And he thinks that this is the best thing because he doesn't want to fight crime. He just wants to live a normal life. And so that that I I, I had a lot of fun playing with with him, like you know, appreciating the, the the powers he has and using them, but then then also going, you know, I just like to be a normal human again. Uh, and he never did, and he realized that he'd never seen the moon over New York City ever. So it was kind of a really mm -hmm. cool thing for him. And it was like, oh yeah, you would never see the moon. I mean, full moon, you'd see partial moons and stuff like that. And I had to do the math and say, okay, it's like the moon's at somewhere between 75 and 80% he'll turn. So some nights he's not sure if he's gonna turn. And I even have it that, you know, when he's under different types of stress, sometimes he turns faster. Sometimes he turns, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't work as, as effectively. I mean, in, in one scene I have him on a, on a stuck on a flight that was delayed six hours. He thought he'd be home in plenty of time, but they're, they're in the air and he's about to turn into a wolf. So you're like, yay, some tension. Oh, okay. That, which book is that one in? Cause that one sounds like that's a really cool scene to see. <laughs> that's uh, fear and longing in Los Angeles. That's when he's, uh, he goes to LA to be on a movie set. And again, when, when his agent says, Hey, I got you there as a, as a consultant, you get to be on the set whatever. And the, you get to meet some of the people. So it's kind of a cool treat I got for you. He's, and he wants to send him away because he's distracted. Ah, oh, you're still in love with your girlfriend. You need to go away. You're, you're being an idiot. Get your head out of your ass, that kind of stuff. And he sends him to LA and Michael's checking the app to go, okay, good. Uh, the, for the whole time I'm going to be in LA, there's no, there's no uh, moon. <laughs> no full moon i'll be okay because again he's, he's thinking like where am i going to change where am i going to run around and i know la has some great hills and stuff like that that he could run around in but he's not as familiar as he is with you know his hiding spots in central park and stuff like that so like you know a lot of times with these kinds of stories you have this sense of like that they can they can um sense their mate you know, they know who their mate is by scent or something, you know, they just know this is the one. Is that what's happening with Gail? Does he just know she was supposed to be his mate, but, you know, circumstances <laughs> negated it? Or is there another mate that he just hasn't met yet? Well, um, the, 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 the great thing, and, and I was inspired by shows like, um, like Castle or the X-Files and stuff where there's the sexual tension between the two lead characters. But it's it's a lot more fun when they're not together. So I wanted Michael to be in love madly with Gail very openly, and Gail to be like, uh -uh, no, just want to be your friend, can't do this. But he can tell that she finds him sexually attractive. She can tell that she still loves him, but she's just preventing that. So that's 
I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun with that. And, there, and there's even there's even a scene in a Canadian werewolf in New York where he's getting makeup put on to go on the on the Letterman show, and he can tell that the woman who's doing his makeup is hot for him. And 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 that's where that's where you kind of see some of his character. And he's not an alpha guy at all. He's kind of like, and he's very sweet and he's kind to her. And and he thinks like, well, if I was a different kind of person, I'd be getting lucky right now you know, or, or, or whatever. And that's just not in his makeup. So he can tell these things, but he doesn't, he doesn't even act upon them. Like even Gail uh, in the love story, when you do the flashback to when they first met, Gail is the aggressive one who makes the first move. Michael's just kind of like pushover kind of, you know, stereotypical beta male kind of guy. Very nice. Very nice. So is this turning into a wolf? Is this a curse? Um, is this a genetic thing? You know, how are you building your world in that? And, you know, would it be passing it on to his child? Like if he had a kid, would would he have it? You know, what what is the mythology of your world? <laughs> Great questions. As a pantser, as a discovery writer, as a writer who writes into the dark, as Dean Wesley Smith says, I all I had was him uh, reference being bitten by a wolf. Uh, when he was hitchhiking to, to New York in upstate New York, he got bit by a wolf. And and then he that's when he first started turning into a wolf. Um, I haven't actually revealed anything about his lineage. In the in the, in the novels, as they continue, there is there is a mythology about there being wolf clans. Uh, he is one of the solo wolves, and he's not even sure his own lineage, but it's very likely that he had wolf blood in him that was dormant. And, and, you know, would normally, you know, you would die from a werewolf bite, but in this particular case, he turns. So obviously he has some sort of lineage, but he hasn't, he doesn't know it yet. Um, he also has this guy who shows up, a traveling salesman that actually saved his life when the wolf attacked him on the highway. And Buddy, um, who's, um, uh, you know, gregarious, uh, sort of uh, almost a cross between Del Griffin, uh, John Candy plays Del Griffin in Plain Strains and Automobiles, a little bit of Buddy Hackett, a little bit of, um, Lou Costello, sort of that sort of character, just happy-go-lucky sort of you know, chunky guy who's just really gregarious and 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 also like Cliff Clavin from Cheers, just spouts trivia left, right, and center and just bores people to death. Buddy consistently shows up all the time and saves Mike's Michael's butt randomly, and and it's kind of like like why? And, and so there's this mis mystery about who Buddy really is and why Buddy keeps showing up to save his butt or his hairy wolf butt or whatever the case may be. Uh, so that's that's also part of the mythology that I'm I'm going to, I sort of have some vague ideas of where it's going <laughs> and maybe I'll reveal them little by little as the books go on. Very cool. So that answers the question, is this series going to continue? Because you're on book six, but you and you have an idea of where you want it to kind of go. Um, do you have like an idea of how many books you want to do or are you just kind of, I know you're a discovery writer and I'm a discovery writer. So yes, I hear you. You know, you just, let's see where these characters want to go. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of playing. I, I suspect there's going to be maybe three or four or five more books, depending. Like I already have, I have a meet, pray and love as, as one of the titles. I, I have an expat Canadian werewolf in London, Ontario, where I want them to go travel to visit some ancestors <laughs> from, from, from Canada. Uh, the lion, the witch and the werewolf. Uh, again, so I have, I usually start with a title and go, oh, this will be like, I did only monsters in the building. I'm like, well, I guess it has to be a murder mystery. What, where, what's it going to happen? Oh, he's in a isolated, whatever. So a lot of them are just like an idea. And then, and then, and then it comes out of there. And sometimes the idea is just, well, it's got to be a play on an existing title that people are familiar with. Cause that's kind of part of the, part of the brand is letting people know it's going to poke fun at itself. There's going to be Michael poking fun at himself. There's going to be some humor in it as well as adventure and, 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 and superhero-ish stuff. I was looking at your, your info and it talks about like how a lot of these, and you're talking about the titles, um, you get a lot of inspiration from like uh, parody and, uh, you know, will, you know, what was the weird Al Yankovic style, um, do you, you know, what are some of the things that, that drive you to that, that kind of genre, you know? 
Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I love I love parody. It's so creative. When you look at uh, what you have to do, what Weird Al has to do for a song is not only make the song have a different meaning, but make the sound and the beats and the and the length and and the style be something different. And so, for the longest time, when I was when I was writing, uh, I would use parody as a warm up exercise. I would take a song or a poem, and I would rewrite it in parody format. And the reason I love that is it forces me to be really, really creative within constraints. And so that was a really, really great exercise. Uh, I've written hundreds and hundreds of parody songs over the years, um, even uh, did a few videos early in the pandemic with my partner. We decided to do a parody of uh, the Steelers Wheel song, Stuck in the Middle with You. We did it as a duet because I wanted to change it up a bit, and we called it Stuck in This House Here with You. And that was a lot of fun to, 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 to play with that creativity. Being a huge fan of Cheers, me being stuck at home, not being able to go to bars, I created Mark's Tavern, which is our bar in the house here where like only Marks are allowed. So it's me playing with video and having me talking. I'm the bartender, I'm the patrons. And using video splicing and all kinds of weird special effects so that I could be talking to myself was just a way I amused myself while we were stuck here in the house. Um, but, but parody is so powerful. And even like the parody nature of the of the titles uh, are fun. Even I, I mean, the chapters of the books all have cheeky Easter egg references, references to song lyrics and stuff. Like even in Hex in the City, there's something that refers to a combination of a Taylor Swift song and Edgar Allan Poe all in one, all in one line. So it just and, and again, most people aren't going to get it, but when the people get it, they go, oh my God, that's from a tragically hip song, my favorite Canadian band or whatever, right? I think that's one of the cool things about being an author is sometimes you have things in your book that maybe nobody else gets, but you get it and it is fun for you, you know? And when other people suddenly realize that it, it's like, ooh, that's nice, you know? That is one of the cool things about us. All right, we're getting the glare. We're getting the glare from Russell. No, we are. We are for sure. So let's do closing comments, questions, statements. Russell, you go first. Okay. Where on YouTube can I find this parody? Is my first question because I've got <laughs> to see that. And you need to tell the readers where they can find your books. <laughs> Thanks, Russell. If you go to marklesley.ca, you'll find a link to my YouTube channel, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. Nobody can ever spell that. So just go to marklesley.ca. There'll be links to my YouTube channel. And that's where you can find out everything you want to know about me and stuff you don't even want to know about me. I love it. Fern, what about you? I am looking forward to um, delving into this world. You know, I am one of those readers that has to start with book one. So... <laughs> So I've got six books to go, but I am excited about it because this is a lot of fun. This is very much up my alley. So thank you for joining us and sharing about your, your books. I look forward to reading them. Yes. Mark, thank you so much for taking time out of your morning to come and hang out with us and have this fun and just inspiring conversation with us and letting us get to kind of pick your brain on werewolves and just get to know you a little bit better besides just being an author. So thanks for spending some time with us this morning. Thank you. It was an honor to get to hang out with you guys. I'm just only sorry I didn't bring you cigars. <laughs> That's okay. Next There's always time. next time. There's always next time. next time for sure. But everybody, we hope that you all have a fantastic Monday, a great rest of your week. And until next Monday, bye for now. 